Hello, I am Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service here in Hancock County, coming to you by Zoom. And if you're watching on YouTube, I would remind you that uh, down at the bottom there, there is a subscribe link. You can hit that and that will let you know when future videos have been uploaded. I try to get uh, these videos uploaded as quickly as I can after I give the presentation uh, so that you can uh, uh, get access to that as soon as possible. And I also want to mention to you, if you are watching by video, that you can put a question down in the comment section if you have one, uh, and I will get a notification of that comment, and I'll be able to come back and contact you and answer that question for you. So please feel free to ask any questions you may have down in that comment section. Of course, if you're here live, uh, by all means, uh, please go ahead, put any questions you have over in the comment section, and I will be able to see those as I am talking, and I'll be able to get to that right away to clear up any confusion, or I can uh, take some time at the end of the presentation to answer questions. Uh, so today we're gonna be talking about vining plants in the home landscape. Uh, vining plants do uh, an excellent job of, of providing some options uh, for particularly for ornamental plants, but also a little bit for vegetables. Uh, so I'm going to talk primarily about uh, using vines as ornamentals, uh, but there will be a few notes about the, uh, the kinds of vegetables that we put up on trellises as well. Uh, so there are several reasons why we want to use vines in the home landscape. Uh, sometimes we just don't have a lot of space and using that vertical space by using trellises uh, can, can just allow us to get the most out of the space that we do have. Uh, if you have an area that you don't want to, uh, you know, kind of keep uh, in a public space, uh, you can use trellises and vines as a divider or a barrier in your landscape and it keeps uh, an area a little bit more private. Uh, or if you know you have a, a fence and you don't want your neighbors to be looking through it, uh, then you can get those vines growing on it as a way to kind of keep that uh, keep that area a little bit more private for you. Uh, now you know another great thing about vines is if you've got a uh, just a long wooden fence or a chain link fence, something like that, having some vines growing on it uh, can really kind of break the monotony, add some color. Uh, and just kind of beautify that feature in your landscape. Uh, and even on your house, uh, you know, we can soften some of those structural lines, make the place look a little bit more natural as opposed to just having all those straight lines. Um, one concept that does work, you know, they talk about green walls uh, and trellising plants is a, is a part of that. Uh, and having those plants growing up against the wall, not directly on the wall, but uh, just, just adjacent to it, uh, can provide a little bit of insulation, help keep that property warm. Uh, here in South Mississippi, that's uh, often not our biggest concern, fortunately, uh, but cutting those uh, cooling or cutting those heating costs can be a, a benefit to having those vines there as well. So when we're picking vines, there are some things that we want to consider. You know, what are we using that vine for? Uh, so if we wanna use something as a screen, we, we certainly wanna pick something uh, that's gonna have a, a dense kind of coarse foliage, uh, something that's going to you know, just produce a good wall of green. Uh, and, you know, if we just want something that's gonna you know, add interest to a wall, then maybe something a little bit more fine textured with smaller leaves, uh, fewer leaves perhaps, and generally a slower growing vine uh, is going to do a good job growing up a wall. And just of course we, we also want to pick out, you know, is, you know, is there a particular flower color we want? Uh, you know, how are we going to use this to complement the other things in the uh, landscape? And sometimes that can be flowers, uh, sometimes that's going to be fruit, sometimes that is going to be uh, just the color of the foli uh, foliage. And of course, you do want to keep in mind you know, how much space are we going to be uh, able to occupy with this vine. Uh, a lot of the vines vary pretty dramatically uh, in how much space they are going to cover. And one thing I, I really want to mention uh, is that it can be important to pick a vine that you're, you, know, you need to know its growth habit. 
uh, because some vines do have a little bit of a tendency to get out of hand uh, and really do need to be watched and managed to make sure they're not going to take over. So uh, choosing a smaller vine, one that doesn't tend to, uh, to grow quite as wild, uh, if you have a small area, uh, is a good idea. If you have a place that's kind of away from the property, uh, you're not worried about that vine uh, spreading out, then by all means, uh, you know, get one of the vines that, that's just going to try to take over the world uh, and just make sure that it doesn't go completely wild on you. Uh, you do want to pay attention to the, the growth habits uh, and the, the preferences of the vine. Uh, you know, pay attention to how sunlight is coming, you know, into that area, how much sun you're getting in the uh, area that that vine is going to receive, um, because some of them are going to really like the full sun that we can get uh, here in South Mississippi. Some are going to thrive a little bit better in a more shaded environment. And broadly speaking, uh, you do want an area that's going to have good soil drainage. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of vines that we're going to talk about uh, that really thrive in wet conditions. Uh, so making sure that you have good soil drainage right in that area is going to be really important. Uh, so, uh, you know, some things to keep in mind, particularly if you already have a trellis up, uh, you do want to pay attention, you know, is that climbing habit going to be appropriate for the support you're using? Um, if what you're uh, planting is going to be right next to a walkway or a sitting area, is it going to drop fruit that would be a potentially a, a nuisance or just a, a kind of difficult to clean up? And uh, my, wife, my wife likes to remind me uh, to pay attention uh, to make sure that, you know, what insects might be prone to coming to that particular vine. Uh, I did plant some vines by our front doorway. Uh, that I thought looked absolutely gorgeous, and, and I still think that they were really pretty, uh, but they were also really popular with bees. Uh, and as much as I enjoy bees, I, I have uh, beehives uh, at my house. Uh, I, I enjoy them being there. I don't necessarily enjoy them being at my front door every time I go outside. Uh, so that is something that you want to keep in mind. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, is this something that's going to require a, a lot of pruning frequently just to keep it in the space uh, that we're trying to manage? Uh, so there are a variety of different ways that vines will grow. We're going to talk just a little bit about that. Uh, a tendril is one of the ones that we're really familiar with. Uh, you can kind of think of uh, of course, passion flower or smilax are two examples. Uh, I always think of uh, of the cucurbits, of, you know, plants like uh, like cucumber. Uh, they produce tendrils, which are just slim, little, flexible, leafless stems, uh, and they reach out and will wrap around whatever support is there, and that just allows that vine to be supported by that structure. Um, and uh, these are really easy to see. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, kind of demonstration or experiment to, uh, to show off to, uh, to young people uh, because it's really interesting how plants react to that physical contact uh, with whatever they are, are growing up against. Uh, so uh, again, a, a tendril vine, you know, it's going to have that little stem that comes out and wraps around whatever it's attached to. A twining vine, on the other hand, is the vine itself uh, is actually going to twine around that support system. Uh, and an example of that would be Carolina jessamine. Uh, that's not what's pictured there, but I tried to find a decent picture of a vine that did actually twine around its support. Uh, and so, you know, those things are going to grow really well on wires and trellises, uh, grow really well on arbors. A, a good contrast to this are, are clinging vines. Uh, clinging vines have uh, little specialized growths that are called adventitious roots. Uh, and those will actually come out, they have what, uh, what's kind of like a little suction cup on them. Uh, and uh, they will cling right up against rock or brick or stucco structures. Uh, and uh, I have some weeds at the house that, that will do this uh, that I constantly have to fight back. Uh, and while they can be really attractive, uh, you do want to pay attention with, uh, with things like this, uh, particularly on 
uh, on stucco structures, and I think also on wood, uh, that those adventitious roots can get in there into those little cracks. And as you know, if you're trying to pull them away, uh, it can actually cause some damage to the surface. Uh, so we want to pay attention and maybe, you know, separate that out from the house a little bit. Uh, one thing to watch out with on wooden structures uh, is that uh, because the leaves and the plant are right up against that structure, it can hold moisture against it. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, you can see those structures start to rot a little bit more quickly. Uh, so climbing vines, absolutely gorgeous in a lot of cases, uh, but really do need to kind of be watched to make sure that they're growing on a surface that they're not going to damage. Uh, and again, there are just a lot of examples of those. I'll talk about trumpet creeper and cross vine as we go through the presentation. Uh, just a, one more, there's sprawling vines. Sprawling vines don't really have a, a natural method of attaching to a support. Um, they can be moved around the support. You know, you can tie them to that uh, to give them a little bit of, of support and a little bit of upward growth. Uh, and climbing rows is a, a really good example of that that's really attractive in the landscape. Uh, you can trellis it, but you need to attach it to the trellis to keep it supported. Uh, so the supports that we use for vines, uh, do we, we do want to make sure that we use a really good sturdy and durable material, you know, particularly for landscape use, for vegetable use, uh, you know, not, not quite as serious. Uh, a little bit easier to kind of you know re replace some of that vegetable trellis. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but you want to use you can use wire or tubing or wood uh, to make a, a perfectly suitable support. Uh, with metal tubing or wire, often they use either copper or aluminum uh, because those materials don't tend to rust out in the landscape, uh, whereas something like iron would uh, would rust fairly quickly. Um, with uh, with wood, uh, you will often see them use red uh, redwood or cedar or cypress, uh, and really that that comes down to that same thing of just wanting to use something that's going to be durable out in the landscape. Uh, if you aren't using one of those, it's a really good idea to use treated wood um, because you want that structure to last for a good long time uh, after you have gone to the trouble of putting it up. Uh, I have seen a, a few. Um, plastic or, or uh, uh, synthetic material arbors uh, that are that are well constructed and kind of have that same appearance of a wood structure, uh, at least from a, from a few steps away. Uh, and those can work perfectly well in the landscape also. Uh, and what kind of structure you're going to use is going to vary a little bit by what type of vine you're talking about. So a twining or a tendril type vine is going to grow best on a wire or a trellis or an arbor. Uh, clinging vines, again, just watch out for brick or masonry walls uh, because they, uh, they do tend to cause damage to those surfaces. Uh, now, a lot of vines do have a, a vigorous growth habit. Uh, they grow relatively quickly. Uh, so you do wanna make sure that you provide uh, you know, an effective support uh, the, the support really is going to need to be sturdy enough to hold up the weight of that plant. Uh, and in, in addition to that, you know, uh, we ha it hasn't been too long since we've had a, a pretty significant wind event down here in South Mississippi. Uh, so you also want to make sure that it can take the weight of the plant and the pressure of the wind uh, blowing on it. And again, just, you know, know the type of plant and the type of support system that's really going to work well for that plant. Uh, one thing I do frequently see uh, is that, you know, you, you know, we see vines growing up trees. Uh, generally speaking, I don't think this is a, a good thing to do intentionally, uh, simply because the vines can, you know, can compromise the health of the tree. Uh, they are, you know, in addition to just taking nutrients away from the plant by, uh, by the root system, uh, they can put weight on the tree, they can block sunlight. Uh, particularly on young and growing trees, uh, you can see the vines compressing the trunk and causing damage that way. 
so I think it's generally a good idea to just keep the vines off of the trees. Uh, if you want to uh, have vines around them, then you can uh, you know, put an arbor or a, a trellis near them uh, and you can kind of get the same look that you might go for. Uh, building trellises is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, you just want to have the, your you know, at least two vertical supports uh, you know, with a mesh that's suspended between them. Uh, you can see in the top version there, that would be a, a trellis that's, or a, that's put up for bean plants uh, and, or you know, you know, other vegetables. Uh, and that is just a plastic mesh that is put down between those supports uh, to provide all the support that, the, that uh, vine's going to need. And you can attach that mesh, whatever sort of support you're using, uh, nails or staples or plastic locking ties. Uh, I have made a, a, a large number of those using zip ties uh, because it's a quick way to do it. Uh, and of course, a, a lot of people use twists of wire uh, to attach those uh, meshes on as well. Uh, you do want, want to use a good metal or wooden stake to uh, support the trellis. Uh, and make sure you drive those deep into the ground. Uh, you want to, you know, I would say at least a foot and pay attention to the length of your support. When you, you know, when you're thinking, you know, I want a six foot trellis, uh, you're going to need a, you know, much longer uh, support than that, maybe seven, uh, seven and a half feet uh, in order to make sure that you're driving it deep enough uh, to provide all of the support that that's going to need. Uh, I would recommend uh, a maximum of about five or six feet between the stakes that you're putting down as the supports for the trellis. Uh, just having those vertical supports there to uh, to keep up whatever mesh you're using uh, is going to help with it, you know, help with load bearing uh, and keep that trellis strong enough to do its job. Uh, one thing that is done again, particularly with vegetables, you can see an example of this uh, down at the bottom there. Uh, is placing the trellis at an angle. Uh, that allows two things. First, uh, you know, you put that facing south where the, the plants are just going to get uh, all the sunlight they can possibly get. And the second thing is that it makes harvesting really easy because you can just get on the other side of the trellis and usually the fruit will just hang right down uh, and you could pick it right off. Uh, when you are putting trellises in, you do want to make sure you leave enough space for you to get behind the trellis if you need to. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to make that trellis something that's easy to remove because you may need access to that wall. Um, and uh, so if you need to paint or if you need to repair something, uh, being able to get behind that wall, you know, you know, get behind that trellis could be important for you. The other thing it's going to do is it's going to allow air movement through. Uh, as we've talked about when we talk about plant disease, having that air circulation uh, is going to be really important to protecting the health of the plant that's growing on the trellis. This is going to allow that water to evaporate away. So it's going to protect the plant from you know, potential disease. And it's also not going to hold that moisture there up against that surface where it might do damage. Uh, there are all sorts of different uh, meshes available. Uh, of course, you know, a lot of people make them out of just, uh, you know, out of uh, boards. Uh, you can use plastic meshes. And of course, there is the classic, you know, galvanized fencing or chicken wire uh, that ornamentally might give you kind of a rustic look, uh, but uh, can be dressed up to, uh, to look very attractive as well. Uh, and just pay attention, you know, if you have a, a plant that's going to be heavier, it's going to produce, uh, you know, heavy fruit or just have an awful lot of vine. You are going to need to have a heavier mesh in order to support that. Uh, planting vines, largely speaking, is very similar to planting every other kind of plant that you might want to put in your home landscape. Uh, you're still going to space them out the exact same way as you would for ground cover, uh, or if you were just planting them uh, uh, regularly. Uh, the only thing you need to do is as they come up, you need to train the vines as they, as they lengthen by just weaving them through the openings in the mesh, uh, preferably every few days, uh, but really just kind of determined by the growth, uh, growth rate of the vine. Uh, you can put container grown vines in the ground really any time of year. Uh, container plants, I, uh, I'm not as strict about when to plant those. 
uh, as we would plant you know, something that's bare root simply because it, it really already has that root system. Uh, you know, certainly you're, you're putting less stress on it if you plant it in the late fall or if you plant it in the early spring. Uh, but as long as you give it enough water after transplanting it, uh, you can get it out there any time of year. Um, if you do have a bare root vine, uh, it tends to be something you see in fruit more than anything else. Uh, then you want to put that in in the spring before you start to get new growth. Uh, just go ahead, you know, as soon as you can, uh, tie that support with a soft cloth. I've seen all sorts of things used, uh, scrap cloth, uh, uh, used hose, um, like the, the hose you wear uh, as, as uh, being things that have been used. And of course, you can see in the top picture, uh, they've uh, come up with little plastic clips that can be used, uh, which just are a little bit more convenient if you can get your hands on them. Uh, it is a good idea to fertilize in the spring just to support the growth of the vine. Uh, 510 5 uh, fertilizer is often recommended. Uh, of course, uh, I would recommend, you know, for any, anything in your landscape, uh, it is a good idea to have that soil test just because it's going to be able to give you more specific directions uh, than you would get uh, just kind of uh, applying a general recommendation. Uh, and again, you know, with anything you plant, watering particularly throughout the first year if it's perennial vine uh, or just watering as it establishes for an annual vine uh, is really going to be important, particularly if the weather is dry, just to make sure that you don't get yellowing or other problems like that. Uh, now, there are some vining vegetables that are really popular. I want to take just a second to, to mention a few of those. Uh, with melons, uh, they can be trellised uh, phenomenally well. Uh, they are uh, in the same, that same cucurbit group, uh, and they will grow right up a, uh, a trellis if one is provided for them. Uh, but because of the fruit being particularly heavy, uh, there is a tendency for the plant to just not be able to support that weight. Uh, and so as a result of that, they'll slip. Uh, not only will your, your vine fall off uh, of the trellis, but oftentimes the fruit will be damaged when it falls. And that's not something that we want to see. Uh, so uh, the way we prevent that is we make little hammocks for the fruit. Uh, and so you can just use a piece of cloth or several strips of cloth, uh, you know, anything that's convenient, tie it on either side uh, of where the fruit is and you just tie it to the trellis and you just use it as a support to help hold up the weight of that fruit uh, and it'll grow perfectly well right there on the trellis uh, and it really is kind of a pleasure to watch them grow because they're up you know you know you can just really see what's going on uh, and it makes it a little bit easier in my mind to, to see any possible problems you've got bugs or things like that it's a lot easier to see them on that trellis uh, than it would be to, uh, to see them down on the ground. Uh, with cucumbers and squash, you don't really have to worry about them slipping. The, the fruit don't weigh quite as much. Um, so uh, the only thing you really have to worry with is that occasionally the, the fruit will kind of jam itself up against the trellis. Uh, so you can you know, walk through every now and again and just see where the fruit are forming and make sure they're not forming in a spot. Where, there, where that pressure is going to be put on the fruit because it'll come out looking funny uh, or it might not be able to develop all the way. Um, kind of going back to the mention of, uh, of you know, providing a support or a hammock for the fruit, uh, I've seen all sorts of small melons done this way, like uh, cantaloupe uh, works particularly well. Uh, I've even seen people do this with watermelon. I've seen it tried with pumpkin. Um, but if you're going to do that with pumpkin, you need a small pumpkin. So uh, the larger ones, uh, you know, particularly large fruited uh, watermelons or pumpkins, really just need to be grown along the ground. Uh, beans and peas are another popular plant to grow on trellises. Uh, of course, there are some bush varieties that don't really need that support. Uh, but uh, they're, you know, the, the pole, uh, pole varieties do very well. Uh, they don't need a lot of really heavy netting, just a lightweight netting. Uh, that lightweight plastic mesh does perfectly well. Uh, and, or you can just attach a good twine between two stakes, top and bottom, and just weave that between the upper and lower wire. 
and the vine will go right up that uh, right up that wire. Uh, one thing you may consider for um, for beans and peas particularly, or for vegetables generally, uh, is because these are annuals. Um, one thing you can do is is you can use yep. sisal rope, uh, or you can use uh, you know hemp twine or something like that. Uh, and just, you know, when you get done at the end of the year, uh, you can just cut down that uh, that uh, rope or twine, uh, throw it right in your compost with the remainder of the vine that you're not using. Okay. It can be important to prune vines. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, a lot of vines do have a kind of an a, a aggressive growth habit. They can grow very quickly. And Periodic pruning is going to keep the plant healthy, keep the plant attractive, and keep the plant in the area where you want it. Uh, so uh, a lot of what we're going to do as pruning is just thinning out interior stems or branches to allow a little bit more air and light in there for the plant to grow. Uh, so where you have a big mass of branches, you can just thin that down. Uh, you do, of course, want to remove dead or damaged wood. And uh, when, to, when to prune is probably the most frequent question. Uh, if it's a spring flowering vine, uh, you want to prune that right after it finishes blooming. Uh, pretty much everything else, uh, what we're looking at is pruning in late winter. Generally, uh, I'll call that February uh, for most of Mississippi, uh, and that's going to do a good job for you. Uh, but it's a really good idea throughout the season uh, to do a little bit of light pruning just to help keep the vine in check, keep it from growing out of, uh, out of control. Uh, one other thing I would like to mention about pruning, uh, occasionally you get a tendency in vines uh, where all of the growth gets very focused up at the top of the plant. Uh, and so you have uh, you know, kind of a long, uh, long vine and then a big bush plant. So one thing we can do uh, is just remove the tip uh, you do a little bit of tip pruning. Uh, when you cut that growing tip, uh, that can promote more branching out and more leafing out down towards the base of the vine. Uh, so if you have something like an arbor or a trellis where you want there to be you know, plant growth all the way over that surface, tip pruning it back can help produce that, that uh, lateral branching and, and flowering throughout that whole area of the plant. Uh, so now I want to talk about some examples. Uh, this list is by no stretch of the imagination exhaustive. Uh, I just wanted to list off some plants uh, that are recommended for the southeastern United States, Mississippi in particular. Uh, there are a few that I, I conspicuously left off uh, this list. Uh, you'll, you'll not see me uh, mentioning uh, wisteria. <laughs> Uh, simply because, you know, as, as popular as it is, and a lot of people have it, uh, it does have a tendency to become invasive. Uh, and so there are a few plants that, that you know, that may be popular uh, that I don't recommend adding to the home landscape, uh, simply because they have a tendency to go wild on us a little bit more than I, I think is reasonable. Uh, and using wisteria as my example of a bad actor uh, for this. I've had an area of wisteria growing on my property uh, since we moved in there uh, four, you know, about four years ago, uh, and I have been trying to kill it for four years. Um, it is a very, very stubborn plant to try to get rid of, um, and, and it has survived all of my attempts to, uh, to manage it. Um, so, you know, not something that, you know, if you're going to introduce that, you want to be really sure uh, that that's exactly what you want and you're willing to do the work to make sure that it's not going to spread out into the environment outside of your landscape. Uh, so a really popular one, a really great colorful uh, vine to add in the home landscape is Clematis. Uh, there are a, a just a wide variety of different colors and flower shapes available. I really like the, the deep blue uh, that's up there um, and, and just think that it's a really gorgeous flower and a really pretty vine to grow. 
Um, there, you know, a lot of these hybrids uh, of Clematis are, are pretty common. Uh, it is a deciduous vine, so it is going to lose its leaves uh, in the winter. It will tend to keep itself to about a height of 8 to 10 feet, uh, which is really convenient because that tends to be, you know, the height of a lot of our eaves uh, for our houses. And, you know, flowering time is, is going to vary by what variety you have. Uh, so it could be all the way from, you know, late spring uh, through the end of the summer. Uh, there is another uh, variety called Sweet Autumn Clematis that's a little bit more vigorous, a little bit uh, larger growing, and, and can grow to about 20 to 30 feet. Uh, so if you're looking for a, a larger plant, that is an option for you. Uh, and uh, just, you know, it has uh, all sorts of flowers, you know, big white flowers that are produced in August and September. Uh, all of Clematis is going to prefer a, you know, really nice, well-drained soil pH in the same range with almost all of our other landscape plants around 6.5 to 7. Uh, prefers uh, full sun or partial shade. Uh, you're going to get a little bit better flowering in full sun than you will if the plant gets a little bit of shade. I always want to add the note there that full sun really means six to eight hours of sunlight. So if it gets a little bit of shade in the afternoon, uh, that is perfectly okay. Uh, just put the crown of the plant about two inches below the soil surface uh, when you're planting it. Uh, and it is a good idea to support it with a little bamboo stake because the stems can be a little bit brittle as they're starting off. Um, and it'll work well on just a light, let a, a light uh, lattice trellis. Uh, speaking of plants that can kind of take over, this is English ivy absolutely looks gorgeous when it climbs over a wall. I just don't know if you want to live in the house that's pictured down at the bottom. Uh, it can try to take over. Uh, I prefer ivy grown in a, in a container specifically to prevent it from getting out of hand, uh, but it can still uh, attach, it still can uh, sprawl fairly well. Uh, it'll go up uh, 20 to 50 feet. Uh, and it attaches to surfaces uh, as, a, as a clinging vine uh, with those little aerial rootlets that we talked about previously. Uh, it does tend to suffer a little bit in the direct sun. It prefers a little bit of a shady location. Uh, so, uh, you know, in the southern area, you know, the southern side of the house may not grow as well. Uh, but, you know, in the north or the west, it'll do perfectly fine. Uh, most people don't really think about flowers for ivy. We're, we're normally growing it uh, for the color of the foliage. Uh, and there are lots of variegated varieties to kind of add a little bit of interest to that. Uh, but it does flower on mature vines. Just again, uh, I really think this is a great plant to grow, but it's a great plant to grow maybe in a large container uh, just to prevent it from spreading out of hand. Uh, one of my personal favorites is trumpet creeper or trumpet vine. Uh, it is another deciduous vine, uh, climbs by both by aerial roots and by twining stems. It'll do both. Uh, it can get as high as 30 feet. Uh, really just gorgeous flowers uh, from orange to scarlet, uh, maybe three and a half inches long. Uh, and it puts them on for a really good long time. It'll, it'll flower uh, all the way from July into September. And after that, uh, it has some, some long fruit on them uh, that kind of add a little bit of decoration through the winter as well. Uh, it's also going to grow well in partial shade. Uh, unlike a lot of the vines we're talking about, it will tolerate wet soils just a little bit. So if you have an area where maybe you don't have the best drainage, uh, trumpet creeper is a plant that will thrive in that location. Uh, you do want to tie uh, the branches to a good, really sturdy support, uh, and they'll uh, you know th tie up the thin vines in early spring. Uh, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, they uh, you know it's a good idea you know so you avoid that top, just having nothing but top growth um, to uh, to pre, you know tip. Uh, give a little bit of a tip pruning, and that's going to keep it, uh, you know, a little bit bushier. Um, another advantage of it is the it does transplant readily. 
Um, so it's really easy to, uh, to pick it up and move it from one spot to another. Uh, so really, a uh, really attractive vine for the land. Uh, Carolina jessamine, uh, another really attractive vine, uh, can grow up to 20 feet or more. Sometimes it's used as a ground cover. Um, so that it works as that as well. Um, and you can just kind of keep that uh, going, just cutting it yearly uh, in late spring after it flowers, uh, just cutting it down to three feet or less. Uh, has, again, really gorgeous yellow flowers that it puts on in the early spring. Uh, really attractive to butterflies and to bumblebees. Uh, and uh, one of the plants that will behave itself and kind of stay in the size that we want it to be. Uh, and that allows us to use it in smaller areas like decks or patios, entryways. It's just a little bit easier to control. Uh, likes full sun. Uh, is really adaptable to a lot of different uh, growing conditions. Uh, so again, if you have an area that's not really ideal, Carolina jessamine will work in it. Uh, and you know, plant, uh, put this in from uh, containers in, in nice cool fall weather, put them three foot apart uh, or as a ground cover, four to eight feet apart as a trellis. And um, you can prune these back very heavily if they've gotten top heavy or they're just kind of spreading out. Uh, you can cut them back, back down to just a few feet above ground level uh, and they will recover from that really actively and, uh, and uh, just return to flower. Uh, morning glory is, uh, a, there are a lot of different morning glories out there uh, that we can uh, uh, we can talk about um, really popular. Heavenly Blue is a really nice variety. Uh, bloom from early summer all the way to first fall, uh, first frost rather. Uh, all sorts of different colors, pinks and purples and whites. Um, oftentimes I, uh, I do think of Morning Glory as a weed just because of uh, uh, it shows up in gardens all the time and people are always asking me how to get rid of it. Uh, but it really does put on absolutely gorgeous flowers um, and uh, you know, really pretty, uh, you know, just productive uh, bloomer. Uh, it will reseed itself very actively. Uh, so one thing, if, if you don't want it to spread, uh, it is a good idea to uh, clip the flowers off before they form their, uh, their seeds. Uh, and, but it's really easy to sow seeds for morning glory in the spring, let that plant come up and vine, uh, and then just replace it the next year. Uh, just really prolifically flowering and, and gorgeous plant. Uh, one quick note, because I, I, don't, I didn't put in a slide about this, uh, but sweet potato is in the same group of plants as morning glories. Uh, and so oftentimes sweet potato, ornamental sweet potato vines uh, are a, a really good option. Um, or you can, just, you can just grow regular sweet potatoes and, and trellis the vines of those uh, as kind of an edible garden feature uh, that's really attractive, has the really nice flowers, uh, or really rather the really nice foliage. Uh, so that's just another option that I kind of wanted to, uh, to mention and include here. Uh, passion vine is uh, what I grew up um, calling maypop, um, really a, a you know, kind of a common wild vine uh, here in Mississippi. Uh, it is a very fast growing, lasts for years. Uh, it'll go right to the top of a fence. It'll also grow right over shrubs and even over small trees. Um, you do often find it in disturbed areas. It's an early secessional plant uh, coming to areas that have been disturbed. Um, and it is supported by uh, tendrils. You'll see those opposite the leaves. Um, they do need to be cross-pollinated uh, by a bumblebee, so you will see some bees around them. Uh, passion vine is, is really attractive. The flowers for these are uh, just really interesting looking, uh, have kind of an interesting history that you can look up that I'm not going to go into here, uh, but I would encourage you to, uh, to go and investigate. Um, 
but they, they do tend to kind of get out of hand a little bit. So uh, it is a good idea to kind of put it in an area that's a little out of the way where it can sprawl all it wants to uh, and, uh, and take over, but you will need to kind of cut it back every now and then. Uh, it, you know, it can grow as much as 12 feet in a season. Uh, so uh, you, you do need to clip it back. Prefers full sun, a uh, little bit of a moist but well-drained soil. Uh, doesn't like heavy clay. Uh, one of the things I, I do really like about passion vine as well uh, is that it is a host for fritillary butterflies. Uh, so the really attractive gulf fritillary that we have. Uh, and there is a, uh, uh, a, a, uh, a fritillary butterfly that's uh, very specific to passion vine uh, as well that is just a really attractive butterfly to have around. Uh, Mandevilla or Mandevilla, however we want to say it, uh, there are a lot of different species of this. So there's all sorts of different uh, uh, growth habits and all sorts of different flowers that we can have there. Uh, works really well trellised or in containers or in hanging baskets. Uh, produces flowers in the early summer and it'll produce again in the early fall. Uh, and it, it's not a plant, you know, oftentimes we, we put a plant in and we might have to wait a year uh, for flowers to come up. Uh, with Mandevilla, it absolutely will just uh, uh, produce flowers right in that first year. Uh, even if you prune it back, it will be, uh, it'll produce that coming year. Um, you do, again, uh, you prefers partial shade, uh, likes well-drained, kind of sandy soil. Uh, just pinch them back as they as they grow, and that's going to promote it being a little bit more bushy, uh, covering the trellis a little bit better. Uh, they aren't really tolerant of cold conditions, uh, so you will want to, you know, the reason why I keep saying, why I say, you know, containers or hanging baskets is it's a plant you are going to want to move inside once the temperatures get down to about 45 degrees, uh, just to keep them good and happy and healthy. Uh, remove out any crowded stems or shorten them down in the uh, in the winter. But just remember, they, they take pruning really easily. Uh, so it's something you can cut back, move inside, uh, and then, and, you know, set back outside as we get into the next spring. We talk about two different kinds of jasmine. This is the first one, uh, which would be common white jasmine, also called poet's jasmine. Um, gets up to about 10 or 15 feet. Uh, kind of a semi-vining shrub, so it does have, can have kind of a shrubby growth. Um, really nice white flowers. Most of the, you know, the really remarkable thing is the, the aroma of those flowers uh, is really great, and you can really pick up that aroma from, from quite a ways away. Uh, can grow, you know, pretty, uh, pretty well, about two feet a year. Uh, prefers full sun. Uh, but it can get out a little bit out of hand, so we do want to pinch it back pretty frequently just to keep that growth controlled. Uh, and you can put them about eight foot apart. Uh, and again, container, you know, put those in in the fall and they'll do absolutely, uh, absolutely well, make very good hedges. Uh, the other example for this is Confederate jasmine, which is not related. Uh, they're in a different genus. They're, they're quite different plants, but their, pla their flowers do look very similar. Uh, really, again, a uh, really pleasant uh, aroma for the flowers uh, produced in the spring and in the summer. Uh, grows up to 20 feet, works really well on arbors. Uh, you can see an image of that there on the, uh, on the slide. And uh, prefers the, the full sun, works well in, in well-drained soil. Uh, you do need to tie the stems into a pretty good heavy support. Uh, to make sure it's going to be able to support this vine. Uh, or, you know, you can you also use this as a ground cover, uh, but you are going to need to trim any of the upward twining stems just to keep it in that habit. Uh, and you will need to, uh, to cut it back just to keep it in the area uh, that you want to maintain it. Uh, another plant I really enjoy for the flowers, I just like that, st that style of flowers, cross vine. Um, cross vine actually gets its name because of the, uh, if, if you take a cross section of the stem, uh, they said that, that that looked like a cross. Uh, 
and, and so that's where the plant gets its name. Uh, it is uh, fairly fast growing uh, and it will maintain its leaves through the winter as long as it's not too cold. Produces these you know, really nice uh, red to yellow uh, uh, trumpet shaped flowers uh, that are just really pretty. Uh, there are other flower colors that are available. That red uh, color with the yellow interior uh, is the native cross vine, but breeders have developed all sorts of different colors. Um, they maintain their flowers for about a month uh, <coughs> as we get into April and May, excuse me. Uh, and the uh, Will allow, you know, it does have a little footing or adventitious root at the end of the tendril that uh, will allow it to uh, attach to uh, structures. Um, so it doesn't actually need a trellis, it'll attach to walls, just, you know, preferably put it up against to something that's not going to damage. And um, keep in mind that it will, it'll move across the ground, but it's only going to flower on upright stems. So I think it works a lot better as a trellis plant. Uh, and it's another one that's not really prone to taking over too much in the area where it's growing. Uh, we talked about roses a little bit more and I would encourage you if you didn't to uh, go back and look at the whole presentation on roses. Uh, but climbing roses are another uh, really great example. Uh, they're more of a sprawling growth. They do need to be attached to whatever they're growing to. Um, all sorts of different options in terms of their flowering shade, our flowering shape and flower color uh, from the, the, the Floribunda, the really large flowers uh, to the hybrid tea roses. Um, and they can be really fast growing. Uh, sometimes their flowers are, are pretty small, but uh, just really gorgeous along fences, along trellises. Uh, make really good thing, you know, really think, you know, great entry ways, uh, but uh, just a really attractive plant to have up on trellis. Uh, didn't want to, uh, you know, uh, keep going too long, uh, so just wanted to mention a few others. Uh, trailing nasturtium, uh, just the same nasturtium flowers. Uh, they'll grow about four or five feet tall, uh, really nice fragrant flowers. Uh, just another really good option for you there. Uh, scarlet runner bean uh, is an edible ornamental, uh, really nice scarlet flowers on uh, twining vines. Uh, and one I grew recently that I really enjoyed was hyacinth bean. Uh, just absolutely gorgeous purple flowers, uh, really interesting kind of reddish purple pods uh, that kind of kept the, the plant attractive in the landscape for a little bit longer. Uh, now, as I mentioned, this is a, a much abbreviated list of the vines that are out there. Uh, there are all sorts of other options, uh, but I just wanted to mention uh, a few uh, that I thought were particularly interesting or particularly good for the landscape here. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Uh, here for the live presentation, I'll be happy to, uh, to take some more, uh, take questions, and I, I have seen uh, that I have some in the chat area waiting for me. Uh, again, if you are watching on YouTube, thank you for making it all the way to the end of the presentation. And again, uh, if you have any questions, uh, just go ahead and put those down in the comments section and I will be very happy to, uh, to come back and answer them for you. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, we'll